ministerial uh, associations with the uh, my campaigns. I've never had an afternoon speaking yet. This is my first one, very first to begin with, and uh, it's all new to me. So as you have to at other times, just forget my mistakes. Why? So uh, do that this afternoon too. Usually, when I'm having healing services, I take the afternoon after about three o'clock at this time, I go into prayer. I stay right in prayer for the rest of the day until they come and get me at night. Then I come out then to <clears throat> pray for the sick. Being a, we had to squeeze our meeting here and, and compile it into just uh, these three services or three days, I uh, thought that I would like to come and kind of have a little time of fellowship with you in the afternoon service. As many of you are acquainted with Brother Bosworth, the late Brother Bosworth, he said to me one day, he said, Billy, you know what fellowship is? And I said, oh, I think so, Brother Bosworth. He says, it's two fellows in one ship. <laughs> That's right. Fellowship. So there's quite a bunch of us this afternoon in the old ship. The old ship of Zion. <clears throat> My little boy, Joseph, the other day, before we left home, uh, he's just about three years old. You remember him. The Lord promised him to me six years before he come. And so, and then the next one was born. When the doctor said there could be no more born, it was a girl came. So a lot of people called me up and said, Billy, the vision meant Josephine, not Joseph. I said, no, it meant Joseph. Doctor, our home doctor there, he said, just impossible, a woman can never have another baby. I said, she'll have one more. So I said, God promised Joseph and Joseph's coming. So when this little fellow was born, they said, is this Joseph? I said, I don't know, but Joseph is coming. So. When the nurse that morning said, Reverend Brenham, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you got a fine seven-pound, three-ounce boy. I said, Joseph, you've been a long time getting here. Daddy's glad to see you. <laughs> I was thinking maybe Billy, my boy, would be a minister, but looks like he isn't. And I asked the Lord to give me someone to hand this book to after he finishes me on earth. I hope to put it in the hands of Joseph as a servant of the Lord. Now, he was laying on the, the little duoful, I think you may call it your Chesterfield, uh, the other morning. I was trying to make him keep quiet because I, I felt that maybe a vision was coming on. And um, he went over and laid down on the, the duoful and was looking up at a painting of Jesus I have on the wall. And he was to kind of a little fellow talking to himself. He says, has Jesus got a boat? And that gave me a text. And then I just picked up my pen and began to sketch off a few little things that I won't, have, won't be able to get. I've never preached on it yet. But that's true. When he was here on earth, he was so poor, he had not a place to lay his head. And he, when he went to preach the gospel, he had to borrow a boat to preach it from. But he's the captain of the old ship of Zion. Now, this afternoon, it's, I thought maybe we would take these two afternoons and compile something together to stimulate faith. And then at night time, when the, the people are here, I'd speak more on the, the ministry that the Lord has given me. But this afternoon, somewhere, to speak on faith. Now, all gifts operate through faith. Remember, you can't get anything from God outside of faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So you must come by faith. Some time ago, I was up in the mountains, and I was hunting elk, and I'm storming, and I got behind a tree until the storm was over. And when the storm left, well, I 
the evergreens had frozen from the water that was falling early in the fall, middle of October in Colorado. And then after that happened, I was standing behind the tree watching, and I noticed the sun peep out in the, through the crevices of the rocks way over here towards California. And you know, God's just so everywhere, you can see him if you just get him on the inside of you. That's what makes it so hard for people to see and understand God because he's not in their heart. If God is in the heart, he, he, shows, you, he, he shows himself to you. And I seen the sunset, and there was God in the sunset. And then I, as you know, my people are Irish except on my mother's side. My mother's mother come from the, from the reservations, the Cherokee reservations. And so I love the outdoors so much, just enough to make me like the outdoors and woods. My conversion never took it out of me, and I'm glad. And then I noticed while I was standing there in the presence of God, about 40 miles from human being, as far as I knew, it was at least 40 miles to a ranch. And then I noticed the sun caused a rainbow as it struck across those uh, evergreens, froze over. Now God is in the rainbow. He made a covenant, the rainbow. And in Revelations 1, he, when John saw him, he had the rainbow and was to look upon a jasper and starter stone, Benjamin and Reuben, first to last, he that was, which is, and shall come, so forth. And then the old male elk began to bugle. He got lost in the herd during the storm. There was God in that bugle. And a wolf got to howling. And the mate answered at the bottom of the hill, There's God in the wolf. Everywhere you look, you can see God. And while I was standing there, I noticed a little pine squirrel. I know you know what they are. A little bitty fussy thing, just all fuss is about all there is to them. And he had jumped up on a little stump and he was just a cutting him a great noise, like he's a, almost a blue coat policeman of the woods. Makes so much fuss. And he's too big to do anything. He's just so long, little bitty guy. And so he was just a carrying on. I wondered, what you so excited about, little fellow? Because I'd got real happy standing here. I'd set my gun against the tree and run around and around and around the tree shouting. Now, you all don't believe it, Baptists shout. I, I was shouting. Of course, I, I am a Baptist, but I'm a Pentecostal Baptist, <laughs> one with the Holy Ghost. And so then while I was carrying on there, if somebody had been in the woods, they thought they had a maniac out there. Around and around that tree, just screaming to the top. Well, I was about to explode. I had to do something, pop off a little steam somewhere. <laughs> Did you ever get so full you just had to say something? That's all. You just got to do it. As David said, my cup runneth over. <laughs> just filled up. And I thought, well, little fella, I I'm, what you so excited about the way I'm acting? If you loved your creator the way I did, you'd be doing the same thing. So, and I was just talking to him, but I noticed the little guy wasn't watching me. He cocked his little head and looked down like that. In an old blowdown where the storms, previous storms, had blowed the tree laps together. And during the time of the hard blowing, an eagle had been forced down into this uh, blowdown. And he's watching that eagle, great big brown eagle, gray eyes. And this big eagle jumped up on the limb, and I said, Well, now, looky here. God, what did you stop me from shouting? Uh, I see in the sunset, call the wolf. I hear him in the call of the elk. See him in nature, everywhere around, just, God, it's good to be here. We could build three tabernacles. But why was it you made that little squirrel carry on like that so I'd see that eagle? Well, I noticed the eagle. He seemed to be that he was, wasn't afraid. He was no coward. God cannot use cowards. No, sir. When you believe God, you've got to believe him with all that's in you. God don't want anyone to say in church, Oh, yes, praise the Lord. I believe it. And then on the outside, I don't know. I still feel bad. He can't use that. You've got to be, you've got to believe God in, out, everywhere you are. Believe God just the same. 
And so I noticed the eagle was brave. He wasn't afraid. And I wondered, why aren't you afraid? Do you know I could take my rifle and shoot you? Well, if he could have read my mind, he'd know that I, I admired him. I admire anything that's not afraid. I hate a coward. And so then I, I noticed him, how he, what makes you so brave? Well, I thought, now he sees my rifle sitting against the tree. And he knows before I could get that rifle and shoot him, he could be in that timber. And I'd never see him no more. He'd just fly through that timber and you'd never catch him man. And so he knew that. And I kept noticing, taking his feathers, you know, and moving his feathers back and forth. I thought, oh, yes. I get the idea. See, God made him an eagle. And he gave him two wings to get away from danger. And he had perfect faith in those two God-given wings. I thought, what if the church had that much faith in the two wings that God gave them, the New and Old Testament, how he could fly away from trouble, fly away from sickness, fly away from sorrow, get away with it. I watched him there for a few moments, and all that little pine squirrel was just cursing him for all that was in him. And he never paid much attention to him, and after a while he got tired of it. So he just gave one great big jump and made a one, two big flops with his wings and he was outside the timber. And then the amazing thing, he never flopped anymore. He just jumped and made a couple of flops and art with his wings to get out of the timber. And then he just knew how to set those wings. And every time the wind would come in, he'd ride up on it. And I stood and watched him till he got smaller and smaller to become a little speck. I stood there crying like a baby. That's it, Lord. It isn't running from place to place, joining the Methodists, joining the Baptists, joining the Pentecostals. It isn't that. It's just get your feet off the ground and set your wings in the power when the Holy Ghost comes in right up on it. Just right on away. He rode away from that chatter, chatter, chatter. Days of miracles path. No such thing as baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's for another age. That's chatter, chatter, chatter down below. Earthbound pine squirrels. Just set your wings in the faith by faith out there and ride in the ways of the Holy Ghost. When He comes in, just ride on away, on away, on away. Get plumb out of hearing distance of it. Now let's do that as we read the Word and study for the next 45 minutes. Let us pray. Oh Lord, it is a gracious thing to come into the presence of God. And we know that you hear because you promised you would. And we're so happy to know that we have a Savior that's uh, the only mediator between God and man that's at your right hand today to make intercessions upon our confession. Anything that we should confess that Jesus has done for us then you are there to make that good. There is a bloody sacrifice laying on the mercy seat today. And we're so happy to know that we have a right to come to that. For when we come to God, we want to come boldly. Not because that we think we're deserving, but because we have been bidden to come by the Lord Jesus Christ. Who said, Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Oh, how perfect that is. And let our assurance today rest solemnly upon thy word, for it is truth. And it is it is written, Let every man's word be wrong or a lie, and God be truth. And we're coming today, Lord. Help us to nail down and clinch on the other side thy words of faith that we might go out of here today better people than we were when we come in. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 I wish to read just one verse of Romans, the fourth chapter. And pray that God will add his blessings to it, the 17th verse. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations. Before him, who he believed, even God, whom quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as 
though they were. Now we're going to study these two days, the Lord willing, on faith. Now, faith does not rest upon the shifting sands of man's ideas, but upon the solid rock of God's eternal, unmovable Word. And faith can take its stand upon the God's Word, the rock of ages, and can stand there in the face of death rejoicing because it looks across the country to him that said, I am the resurrection and life. It believes God. Now, the reason that I chose today this subject of Abraham is because that we are Abraham's children. The Bible said that they that are in Christ are Abraham's children, Abraham's seed. And these promises that was made to Abraham was not only to Abraham alone, but to his seed after him. Now, the promises that he made Abraham was to us also. Now, remember, you don't have to be born with a Jew outwardly to be Abraham's seed. Because when we are take on Christ, we are Abraham's seed. Because it was the promised child through Isaac that brought Christ, and through Christ we are Abraham's seed. May I quote it like this? If we be dead in Christ, then we are Abraham's seeds and are heirs according to the promise. If we be dead in Christ, died to the things of the world, alive in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed, and all the promises is to Abraham and his seed after him. He was a father of not a nation, but nations. God made him. Oh, we could dwell on this for months, but we just got to hit the high spots now for the, for the two days. And now, remember, this is to encourage your faith that you might lay hold on God. And everything that he promised Abraham, you are heirs of it. Now, the first place, I want you to notice that he was a father of nations, every nation that believes on him, believes on God through Christ, Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And the promise that was given to Abraham, not if you will, the covenant was altogether grace, for when he gave it, the covenant made a covenant between Adam and himself. Adam broke the covenant. Every time man breaks his part of the covenant, but this time it was absolutely unconditional, the covenant was. It was God's grace determined to save man. Not if you will, I have. It's already a finished work. Now look, you say, does that apply to me? Certainly. Many people say, oh, I sought God and I sought God and I sought God. That's an error. God sought you, not you seeking God. It wasn't Adam running up and down through the garden hollering, Father, Father, where art thou? It was God screaming, Adam, Adam, where art thou? See, he reflected then what all man was, a hider. Instead of man coming right out and confessing his wrongs and being honest before God, man tries to hide back behind some kind of a fig leaf of there. It's still the nature of man to do that. It's just in him to do it. Instead of just confessing and saying, I'm wrong, God, you help me, or just taking God at his word, he'll try to find some way to bypass it. Ministers today, many of them, try to find a way to bypass divine healing, try to bypass the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no way of bypassing it. People go right on receiving it just the same. 
they're going to receive it anyhow because it's a promise of God. Now, Jesus said, and we wouldn't argue with him, Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Then it was God knocking at your heart. Not you seeking God, it was God seeking you. So you see, the covenant is to you also a grace covenant. Because it's God's grace calling you. God hath. He never chose him, he chose you. Out of the millions in the world today, he reached down and chose you because he put your name on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible said. That's right. Before there was a world, Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. Because when God speaks anything, it's so perfect. It has to take place, and it's as good as done when God speaks it. Amen. 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 The trouble with the church is scared. Oh, I'm afraid of this. Don't be afraid. You say, oh, if I can... It, it isn't you, it's Him. I, I'm not worthy of healing. Sure you're not. I'm not. Nobody's not. But He's the one. It isn't our worthiness. It's His goodness to us. Say. In the Old Covenant, what if a little mule would be born out in a pasture some night? I don't know whether you ever farmed any or not, but this mule was born with flopped ears. That's a horrible mule to begin with. And he's not kneed. And he's cross-eyed. His tail sticks right straight up. What a horrible-looking mule. Now, if he could look around to his mammy, he'd say, You know what? As soon as the master of the house comes out, He'll knock me in the head. I'm not even worth eat, uh, the food I'd eat. I'm no good. But if his mammy was really instructed, she'd say, wait a minute, son, just a minute. I'm going to tell you something you don't know. That's what I want to tell you. See? You don't know who you are, son. You see, you are born under a birthright. And when the master of the house, I don't care what you look like, when the master of the house comes out to see he's got a, a new mule born, then the thing he has to do is go get a lamb without a blemish and take that perfect lamb and that perfect lamb dies so you can live. Then the little mule can kick up his heels and have a big time. Well, that's the way it is with us. We're imperfect, no good. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. We're no good to begin with. But God don't look at you. He looks at the sacrifice. He looks at the Lamb. He doesn't see you because He sees Christ. Jesus died for you. Now, if you can find some fault with Jesus, then your healing might not be right. But if you don't find no fault with Him, it's perfect. Sure. God called you by His grace. Not that you would, but that God would. The Scripture said He was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That was God's Word. When God speaks, it's as good as finished right then. So how are you going to stamp out the baptism of the Holy Ghost? How are you going to stamp out the gifts? How are you going to stamp out the church? You can't do it. God spoke it, and it's going to be. That settles it. Certainly, it'll materialize somewhere. Then, when God foresaw by His foreknowledge how He would redeem the world of sin and corruption, He slayed Christ before the foundation of the world when He spoke the Word. Four thousand years before it was manifested. Now, the book of Revelation says, when the Antichrist comes up on the earth, He will deceive all, all upon the earth whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life from the last revival. No, no. no, no. From the foundation of the world. God by foreknowledge knew you and called you in Christ and put your name on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. What are you scared about? Are you afraid to take His word for anything? 
Don't be afraid. Call the thing right. I, I'm an heir to this. Oh, I know I don't deserve it, but I'm an heir anyhow. Because I'm an heir, I receive it. Amen. That's it. There you are. Because I am an heir. That's it. We're heir of salvation. Heir of the Holy Spirit. I'm an heir because Jesus paid the price. Nothing I had to do, I just fell heir to it. Amen. I'm healed because I'm an heir to it. My diseases are gone. My affliction is gone. Why? Because I'm an heir to it. Oh, perfect assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. That's our story. Oh, then Satan can't stand that. See, because he's a defeated being. He's nothing but a bluff. Jesus paid the price. Called us by His grace. We're heir. What a perfect uh, setup that is. See, He's already defeated. I never defeated Him. Christ defeated Him. I'm just claiming my own God-given privileges. That's all you do. You just tell Satan, get away from here. I've got an abstract deed on this building. <laughs> it's mine. I aired it. Notice Abraham. He was just an ordinary man. Come down from the Tower of Babel with his father. And they settled down in the... Probably he's up there in the land of the Shanghai. Or come on down into the city of Ur and the land of the Chaldeans. He was just an ordinary man, not nothing, not no saint, no God. Oh, Syrian. Just an ordinary man, yes, a Syrian. Just an ordinary man. Nothing about him any different than anyone else, no more than there is you. Just an ordinary person. But God saw something in him. Yeah. And he called him. God seen the same thing in every born again man and woman here. Now, Abraham wasn't afraid to put his to work. Are you? The same faith that he gave Abraham, he gives it to you freely if you'll use it. Say, I have a gun. It'll shoot. It's a good, true shooting gun. I hang it up on the wall. I say, yes, oh, sure, I got a gun. What do you do with it? It hangs on the wall. That's faith. People say, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I believe God can. But what do you do about it? Put it to work. Turn it loose. Do something with it. Get out and hunt up the devil where he says, you're still hurting. Say, you're a liar. Pull a beat on him. Get him in the scope. Don't be afraid to pull a trigger because it'll go off as sure as anything. <laughs> yes, sir. It'll boomerang on him. So, hold on. Abraham, like God, called those things which were not as though they were. Anything contrary to God's promise was a lie to Abraham. That's it. Right. Anything contrary. That's good so then, when Abraham started out, when God called him, now watch, the first thing God did to Abraham was call a absolute separation. That's it. That's exactly. That's it. You've got to separate yourself yeah. from all unbelief. <laughs> Get away from it. That's it. You've got to get away from unbelief. God called Abraham to separate himself from his kindreds, from everything that he had, that he might walk with him. Give him a strange land. That's the way every sinner, when he gets saved, he comes into a strange land among strange people. God calls for separation. And he said, Abraham is going to give him this baby. Now, Sarah was 65 and Abraham was 75. Now, I want you to notice how I fixed him to start with. Now, we say we're Abraham's seed. Now, Sarah, 65, 40, 50, 60, that's 25 years past menopause. Lived with her since she, she was his half-sister. Probably married her when she was 18 years old. And here she is, 65 years old, 
And Abraham, 75 years old, and God told Abraham that he was going to give him a child by Sarah. Now separate yourself from all the unbelief. Now bring it to pass. And if you notice, he never brought it to pass till Abraham completely did what God bid him to do. Abraham wandered and done everything else, but God never did bless him till he absolutely separated himself from all that he told him to do. And God will never bless you and bring it to pass until you're ready to separate yourself Amen. from everything. Amen. Contrary Amen. to God's Word, just separate yourself Amen. from it. I don't care what the doctor says, what the psychiatry says, what anything else says, God said so, and Amen. that makes it right. Amen. Amen. I can hear God giving the commission today. Well, uh, I'm got a mixed audience, multitude here, and the audience. Listen to me now. You listen to your doctor. About every twenty-eight days, you know what I'm speaking of. I see Abraham get up next morning after he told Sarah and said, "Sarah, dear, yes, honey. Is there any difference? No, nope, no difference. Well, glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow." Go down to the store and buy you some booties and buy some bird eyes and some pins and get ready because we're going to have a baby. Well, honey, I'm 65. It makes no difference. God said so. That settles it. That's Abraham. See? Believes the same thing. If God said so, that settles it. That's all there is to it. God said so. That's the first thing. You see nothing else but God's Word, God's promise. It's already happened because God said so. It's a finished work when God said so. Why does I depend on those visions? Like in Africa, see those blind deaf and see it before it happens and stand out and challenge the whole world. 500,000 Bombay. Why? God said so. It's got to happen. God said so. That settles it. If it's always God, it's always right. So don't try to use your own intellectuals Use your heart. Now remember, you don't never try to reason. We cast down reasonings. Well, in the Garden of Eden, the devil took a man's head to work through. God took a man's heart. And the man's always working to what he can see. And faith makes him believe things he cannot see. Uh-huh. But he believes it because God said so. That settles it. That's just the story of faith. Now... Then uh, Abraham goes out. Could you imagine an old man, six or seventy-five, and a woman, sixty-five, go downtown and say, "Doctor, we would like to make the reservations at the hospital for a newborn baby." Oh, your grandchild? No, no, ours. <laughs> Yours? How old is this woman? Sixty-five. How old are you? Seventy-five. And you're going? Oh, well, uh, yes, sir. Uh, what is your address? I, I'll call you later. He's off at the head. Every man that believes God's considered the same way. Because faith is ridiculous to anybody except he that's got it and God who gives it. The world is so intellectual till it doesn't see faith. It's just as real to Abraham as the sun shining or anything else. Because his heart said so. God stays on the control tower in your heart. Controls your emotions. Controls your faith. Controls all you are. When God comes into the heart, He takes over. Now we can see Sarah. Yeah. Now we're going to wait another 30 days or 28 days. How you feeling, honey? No different. Hallelujah. Have it anyhow. God said so. A year passes. How you feel, honey? No different. Praise God. We'll have it anyhow. Ten years passed. How you feel, honey? No different. Hallelujah. It's going to be greater than ever. Now, instead of 65, you're 75. Plum on until she's almost 100. He was still, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong giving glory to God. And instead of getting weaker, he got stronger. And we come up the prayer line to go to the meeting and see the presence of God. We say, Lord Jesus, I believe you heal my hand. In about an hour, get outside. Uh, how's that hand? You said, well, I don't know. <laughs> Next morning, that hand any better? I just can't sit, sons of Abraham. 
Be strong. We can't wait on him five minutes and Abraham waited on him 25 years getting stronger all the time. And we begin to weaken the the first minute for time to get off the platform. If it isn't a spontaneous miracle, then you begin to say, Oh, I don't guess. Maybe I ought to go back when Brother Roberts comes. Uh (laughs) Well, maybe Brother Bram, give me another prayer card and I'll go through. Abraham's children. (laughs) When God's Word has come to be made true and real to your heart, anything contrary, any time is a lie. God told the truth. Amen. Right. It's going to happen anyhow. How's your hand? No different. As I can see, but praise God, it's healed anyhow. God said so. I remember old John Ryan. He come through the prayer line at Fort Wayne. He'd been blind for years. And he's Catholic by faith. And he came through the prayer line. Now, do you Catholic? You know, I'm Catholic too. You knew that, didn't you? Sure, I'm Catholic. I met a fellow the day. He said, Billy, the strange thing to me is that you... Your sincerity and yet not Catholic. Oh, I said, I am a Catholic. He said, I didn't know that. I said, oh, yes. Oh, and I said, sure. Universal. Yes, sir. I said, now, is it true? My people are Catholic, you know. And I said, is it true that the Catholic Church teaches that this is the history of the Catholic Church? Jesus Christ ordained the Catholic Church. Twelve apostles made Peter the first pope. That's right. They'll agree with that. I said, well, then, you know, when he set up the first pope, Peter... And he set up all the apostles, and they wrote this. I said, now, of course, you say the church has power and authority to change anything they want to. I believe that, see. They don't teach the Bible because it's something in the past. I said, then, I just believe what the first bunch of Catholics taught. So I'm an old-fashioned Catholic. (laughs) Peter said there's no other mediator between God and man, the first pope that walked with Jesus. And now you've got all kinds of dead women and dead men interceding. And they, I, I see. I don't. I believe the old-fashioned Catholic. And you know, Jesus, the establisher, said in the last book of the Bible, if any man will take anything out or add anything to, the same will be taken out of the part of the book of life. So I just rather be an old-fashioned Catholic. See. So this man come to the platform and he said, and he passed by, and the Holy Spirit came and said, "You are blind, sir." Your name is John Ryan. Yes, sir, that's right. And I said, you beg for your living and sell pan- or newspapers it is on a corner. Yes, sir, that is right. I said, you've been blind from an explosion. Happened years ago. That is true. See, he said. And I looked back and I seen the old man seeing in a vision. I said, thus saith the Lord, you're healed. You started off the platform. He said, but I, I don't see. I said, that has nothing to do with it. You're already healed. God said so. I've seen it in a vision. He said, well, what shall I do? I said, just keep praising God for healing you. So he come back in a few minutes. He said, but I'm not healed yet. I said, you told me you believed me. He said, I did. I said, do you still? He said, I do. I said, what are you questioning me about then? Go on, believe. So he said, well, what must I do? He said, I'm Catholic. I said, well, that's all right, but I want, I want you to keep believing he said, what must I do? Keep thanking God for your healing. Just like Abraham did. Call those things which are not as though they were. And the next night, he was sitting up in the second balcony. And every once in a while, he'd say, everybody keep still. He'd raise up and say, praise the Lord for healing me. He'd sit back down. I was preaching. He'd just stop me. And ever, he'd get out on the corner, selling his papers. And I'd say, extra, praise the Lord for healing me. Extra, praise the Lord for healing me. And... Selling his papers. About two or three weeks after I left, a little boy led him across to the barber shop. Now he's preaching divine healing on the land on the field today. And so led him across the barber shop to get a shave. Well, the little smart aleck barber, you know, had more intelligence and he had gumption to know how to control. So he set him back in the barber chair and lathered up his jaws and shaved about one side down. He said, Say that, I heard you was up to see the divine healer when he come up. I said, Yeah, I was up. He said, I heard you got healed. He said, yes, praise the Lord for healing me. And his eyes come open. And he jumped up out of the barber chair with a towel on his neck, and the barber chased him with a razor in his hand. Down the street they went. Praise the Lord for healing me. See, he stayed with it. Stay with it. Hold on. God said so. That settles it. Stay right there. Oh, it'll take place if you can believe it. Amen. Yes, sir. Hold on. That's what Abraham, 
Why, the Hallelujah. doctor says, old fellow, you better go back home because you're getting a little bit off your mind. He's, the Lord of God will have it anyhow. Maybe the doctor sent a runner out and said, hey, what about that baby case? Go to heaven anyhow. Praise the Lord. Go to heaven anyhow. It's all finished. God said so. We got the boots. We got the pins. We got the bird eye. We got everything ready. It's coming. When's it going to be here? I don't know. But God said it anyhow. We're going to have it. Amen. That settles it. I don't know when it's going to be. That's up to His wisdom. But we're going to have it. When a man takes God at His word, you're going to get it. I don't care what takes place. God said so. That settles it forever. That's all of it. Then, we see the first thing you know, Abraham hadn't got to the place yet. He took, instead of going by himself like God told him to do, separating himself, he took the old man along, his dad, and then that was trouble till he was gone. Then here come Lot along, his nephew. There started arguments. You see, God wants you to do what He says do. Don't hang on and say, now, I would go down to that meeting. I'd bring Susie down, but her mother doesn't... Bl-. That don't have nothing to do with it. See? Yeah. Separate yourself from Amen. every unbelief. Amen. Then God will act in your stead. He'll act for you. Now, we can see them going down, and first thing, some arguments come. Yeah. And now, Abraham, acting as a Christian would do, showed that God's faith and spirit was in him. He gave Lot... His own choice. That's the way a Christian spirit does. It always goes the extra mile or gives the coat. Amen. Now you look up. Here's the land. We'll not argue. We're brothers. Uh, you just, if you go east, I'll go west. If you go south, I'll go north. But we won't argue. Let's be brothers. For we are kindred. I was talking to a young man a while ago. He was talking about God. And I said, you see, the Spirit of God in a man... He meets someone, it's like through a shady glass, but he knows that something in there is his brother. What a love. Someday when that veil is taken away, then we'll know as we're known. But Abraham giving Lot the choice. Now, of course, Lot being a man of the world, he looked around for the best. So he looked around to see where the meeting that would pay off the best. <laughs> so he looked around to find out where it would be the greatest for him. So he began to look towards Sodom. Now he saw Sodom, the fine watered fields of, of the river, as she watered the plains there, and grass, and plenty of grass for the cows, and this was all barren up here. That's the way people make their choice today. They say, well, if I want to be religious, I'll, here's a church that's already established. It's a great church. It's a big church. It's got plenty of money. It's fine people. Be careful. By faith we choose. See? By faith. Now, Lot saw Sodom in all of its goodness, but he didn't see his children burning up down there. He never saw his wife stand out there in the plains as a pillar of salt. He didn't see those things. He thought maybe a few extra dollars he could make. But he never seen those other things. That's what we got to look by faith and see. Like Moses looking out the same window that Pharaoh did upon the same people Pharaoh called them mud daubers. That's all it was. It's a bunch of slaves. But by faith, Moses saw them to be the promised people. When I left the Baptist church to come over to be with the full gospel, well, I, I was quite a, quite a thing. But I thought this, they've got something. They've got the Spirit. Now, I'm not degrading the Baptist church. No, sir. They're my brothers. See? But I've seen something great. I've seen the possibilities of a united church like we are here this afternoon. Oh, my, the different phases of them all come together as one. That's when God's going to move. That's what's holding back the millennium. <laughs> oh, that's what's holding back the Spirit of God from taking this great church is because it's, not, it's been separated. But when we come together, when the people that's called by my name shall assemble themselves together. So then Lot went on down. We understand that he got in trouble. And then as soon as Lot went away and God got Abraham, when Abraham had fulfilled everything that he promised God or God promised him that he would do him, then God came to him. Now when you separate all yourself from all the tags that God don't want you to have, then God will come to you. Now, he said, rise up, Abraham. Look east, north, west, and south. 
It's all yours. I give it all to you. The meek shall inherit the earth. We know that. Notice, look everywhere. It's all yours. Get up. Don't just sit there. Get up and walk through the land. See how you like it. That's the trouble with people today who call themselves Christians. Somebody say, uh, you know, if I owned anything, I want to see what I got. I'm nosy. If somebody give me a house, I'd look at every inch of it. I want to see what it looks like. Climb up. That's the way it is when I become a Christian. I want to see what I'm heir to. Amen. (laughs) Oh, my, I find a whole storehouse full of promises. As a, it just ain't going to put your name on the church book and do the best you can. You're an heir. Right. Hallelujah. Look through the storehouse. What's a great big arcade? You was baptized into it. It's yours. You heir. I'll go around and look in this counter and see what I got here. And go over here and see what I got over here. Anything that looks a little bit too high, I'll get me a step ladder and climb up to it. If I see anything that looks like I'm going to reach up to divine healing or something, I'll get on Jacob's ladder and just keep crying until I get up to where it's at. I want to see what it's all about. Amen. You're heir to it. Heir of salvation. Heir of divine healing. Heir of every redemptive blessing Jesus died for. You are the heir to it for. You're Abraham's seed. You're heir of the whole thing. Amen. I feel religious. Amen. 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 Know that I'm an heir you may think I'm just a little crazy, but if I am, just leave me alone. I'm more happier this way than it was the other way. So I, I like this way the best. And so uh, when I know that I'm an heir, heir of salvation, heir of every promise, why you Pentecostal people, you say, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Then act like it. Amen. Walk around and see what you, see what you got in here. It's all yours. You're heir to it, so walk around. Take possessions. It belongs to you. God gave it to you. What a beautiful promise there. Then we find out the trouble set them down in Sodom. Kings come through and took Lot, run away with him and his wives. And Abraham heard it. Now, Abraham played the part of a Christian again of Christ going out after the fallen brother. To bring him back. Christ went out after the fallen brother to bring him back. Here's just a little something on the side now. You smear this butter on it if you get home think about it. Listen. As soon as they got back, Abraham, from the slaughter of the kings, kings come out to meet him. And Melchizedek came to meet him, which was the king of Salem, which is the king of Jerusalem, king of peace. He had no father. He had no mother. He had no beginning of days or no ending of life. He's still alive. Ever who he was. He never was born. He never had a papa. He never had a mama. He never had a day he started. He never had a day that'll end. Who was he? Watch this guy. As soon as the battle was over, now what did he bring out? Bread and wine, the communion. And they took communion after the battle was over. Let's fight now. Bring back the lost brother. Jesus said, I'll drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom after the battle's over. Amen. Melchizedek came out, met Abraham, and gave him communion. And some of you mothers, I want you to notice something here too. On the tithe pain. Now, Levi was yet in the loins of Abraham when he met Melchizedek, and the tithes that Abraham paid to Melchizedek was allotted to Levi. For the Bible said that Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was yet in the loins of Abraham when he met Melchizedek, which was his great-great-grandfather. I wish I had enough time here to preach on sowing to the wind and reaping the whirlwind for you. Listen here. That's what America's done. Look at these way back a long time ago, the old flapper of long ago. Her daughter today's a coarse girl. What's her daughter going to be? See, what you do bears something upon your generations to follow you. Sins does, the three and four generations, and righteousness does. For there he lauded that to Levi paying tithes when he was in the loins of his great-great-grandfather, 
Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Levi. There you are. Great, great grandfather, he paid tithes in the loins of Abraham. What a beautiful thing there, folks. Live right. It'll, it'll do something to your children to follow you. On, on. Keep living right, doing right, separating yourself from the things of the world, and live godly in this present world for Christ Jesus. Now, let's skip just a little farther. We've got about seven or eight minutes yet, according to the time on the clock. Now, let's go just a little bit farther. Then, God wanted to make this oath, uh, confirm this oath to Abraham. Now, he's getting real old. Now, I want you to now take your cherry pie now and get your fork to lay the seed over to one side if you hit one. And then if you don't, then you lay your seed over and keep eating pie. And if you're eating chicken, I never eat the bone, but it never stops me from eating chicken. I just keep on eating chicken, lay the bone down. That's why you do now the same thing. He's going to confirm the oath to him. So he said, Abraham goes out and he said, get me a, a, a heifer of three years old and uh, the ram and so forth and a turtle dove and a pigeon. So if you notice, Abraham made the sacrifices ready and cut them in half and laid them up against each other. But the turtle dove and the young pigeon, he did not separate. Oh, we had time to go into that on that divine healing. See, why he didn't cut those? But however, when he laid them together, Abraham watched then and kept the birds off for the sacrifice until the sun was going down. Oh, now watch. How he's confirming this oath. And oh, my Armenian brethren, sit still just a minute. Listen to this. Notice, just as the sun was going down, a great horror fell over Abraham. Death that's due to all man. Horror. Then after that, come a smoking furnace, every man due to go to hell. But after that, Come a little white light and pass between these. <laughs> oh, my. Do you get it? What he's speaking of Christ, you see. Now, notice. Now, in, now, here in America, when we make a covenant, we go out and have a sandwich and talk it over and get up and shake one another's hand. It's agreed. That's the way we make a covenant. And uh, Japan, the way they make a covenant, I understand, is get some salt. And they pitch salt on one another. That was a covenant. Making a covenant. And we shake hands. Every place and every nation has its customs. But Abraham in the Oriental country, the covenant was then, if they made a covenant, they wrote it out on a piece of paper or a piece of script of some sort. And then they killed a beast and cut the beast open and stood between this beast's body and took this piece of paper and took their oath and tore it apart gave one to one party, the other party taking the other, and took an oath that let their body be like this dead beast if they ever broke this covenant. See? And then when they come together, both those pieces of paper had to dovetail one against the other because you cannot duplicate it in any way. The way it's tore, it has to be the same. Do you see what happened? Look, God, through Abraham's seed, took Christ to Calvary. And he tore him apart, tore the soul away from the body. He raised up the body and took that part of the covenant and set it on his right hand and sent the Holy Spirit back to the church. So the church will have to be filled with the same spirit that was in Christ at the resurrection. It's got the dovetail, one against the other. Amen. Hallelujah. What is it? Abraham's seed. Glory. Oh, I feel very religious. <laughs> yes, sir. See, you could join church, you could do anything you want to, but the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead has got to be in you. Amen. 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 He tore him apart. We got the Holy Ghost, he's got the body. Someday it'll join together and we'll be one. That day, you know what I'm and God, God and me and me and you and I. Oh, it's that day. You get it? Confirmed it with an oath by himself. That's what he would do. How can you get in? How can you have faith? No one of these people, lots of people in the world today, don't believe in divine healing. They've never received that covenant. 
When God gives you the covenant, He gives you the Spirit, the Christ, the, the thing that was in Abraham comes in you. You believe it just like Abraham does. He chooses you by faith and takes the Spirit that was in Christ and put in you. As I said last night, maybe a spoonful, but it's the same kind of chemicals as in the entire Christ. You are part of it because you're sons of God, daughters of God, born to the Spirit. Then that same Holy Spirit makes you call anything contrary to God's Word as though it was not. There you are. That's the covenant that He made with Him. Then, after He made the covenant where... We're in the 17th chapter now, starting at 11, and we've over to 17. Hit the high spot, and then we'll close because we just got a few minutes. After he did that, then he appeared to him in the 17th chapter of Genesis, and he appeared to him in the name of God Almighty. Great God Almighty. I like that name. Almighty. If he's Almighty God, he can do all things. And if he cannot do all things, then he's not Almighty God. I like that. And the word from Elohim, El being God, he is actually the name is El Shaddai. I may not pronounce that word just right. Uh, El Shaddai. Now, El is God, like Elohim. Shad is a breast, like on a woman. Shaddai is plural, breast, breasted. That he is the breasted God. What a consolation to a man now 100 years old, holding on to a promise for a baby through his wife at 90 years old. I am the breasted God. I'm the strength giver to my people who's got my promise. I've got a breast for them to nurse their strength from. You're 90, you're 100 years old. Sarah's 90, but I am the breasted one. I'm the strength giver. That's all it takes. Say, Brother Brandon, the doctor told me I had cancer, going to die, but I am the breasted one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Elohim. I'm El Shaddai. Oh, Abraham, you're a little old, drawn up, shriveled up looking fella. That's right. Hundred years old, stooped over long whiskers and long hair, stooped back in little old Sarah, just about big as your fist. But I am the breasted God. How is he breasted? One, he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we were healed. Every believer of Abraham, he's still the breasted one. If he needs salvation, he's got what it takes to give you salvation. He's got, he's got two breasts here, the New and Old Testament. <laughs> you just lean right against it and begin to nurse. Say, well, I'm, uh, I've been an awful sinner, just keep nursing. <laughs> Watch how your eyes begin to clear up. You, you get away from that analogy you've been having. <laughs> Spiritually an allergy. <laughs> that anemic condition, your blood's all gone. Just nurse from His strength. Draw from His promise. I'm the Lord that healeth all thy diseases, that forgives all of thine iniquity, the breasted one. And another thing, just like a baby, when he's sick and fretting and all upset and disturbed, and if the mother will take that little baby and put it up on her bosom and just pat it a little, and when it, it's not well yet, but as soon as it gets a hold of the mother's breast and tastes that milk from the mother, it begins to be satisfied. And when a child of God, here it is, get it? When a child of God begins to break through that dark mist of unbelief and gets a hold of God's promise and begins to draw from it, draw from it, it shuts up about his sickness then. <laughs> Begins to draw from it. It's satisfied. They don't say, well, my hand's no difference. They don't even look at the hand anymore. Why? It's looking at where its strength's coming from. My strength cometh from the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise our God. <laughs> He's worthy of all the praise. He is the breasted one. Lean up against Him. And begin to draw. 
Get the first big mouthful. How much vitamin that's got in it. My. Then again, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. I've, he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we're healed. I'm a child of Abraham. I've got just as much right to that breast as Abraham did because God said so. It's mine. Uh, what is a breast? It's a promise. God made the promise. It's yours. It belongs to you. It's to every child of Abraham, every son or daughter has a right to the same promise. Now, what if the mother gave the baby the breast and the baby refused to take it? The baby will die. That's all. And the baby does this time takes his first mouthful, become a big, fat, healthy baby. But it's laying there drawing and satisfied while it's drawing. First thing, the warm milk gets into its little stomach and its little bright eyes begin to roll around. Mommy pats it. He knows it's coming along just fine. You just take God one time like that. You children of Abraham, say, Lord God, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that you, you sent him to the earth. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. I'm laying right against that promise right now. I believe right now that I swallow the first big mouthful. I feel it warm as it goes down into my heart. I believe I feel better already. Do you? Sure. Oh, my. The little toes begin to wiggle. The little hands begin to move. <laughs> Something's taking place. Why? You're nursing from the breasted God that your father Abraham nursed from. Oh, God have mercy. Believe Him with all your heart. Let us bow our heads. How many in here desires to come up to God's promise now? Up to Calvary. Look at the right and the left hand. Wounded for our transgressions. With His stripes you were healed. The breasted God. You have a right to these things. Will you raise your hands to God and say, Be merciful to me, O God. And let me now draw from that breast. Raise your hands if you desire it. God bless you everywhere. Wonderful. Lord, oh, we appreciate you so much. The great Holy Spirit, the confirmation that you keep your word. Did not our Lord look down through the time and see how man would stretch the word and make it say things that it was not intended to say? Oh, we realize that, Lord. But we're so glad that he said this. I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll pray the Father. And he'll send you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And he will abide with you forever. One that would confirm the word. And you said when he comes, he'll testify of me and will show you things to come. How glad we are today, Lord, to have the presence of the Holy Ghost. There to let the sick man or woman just now that raised their hand see maybe for their first time that breasted God, the honor of Calvary, to see the blood by the same blood from the same man, both streams flowed parallel one to the other. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Let that man or woman, boy or girl, that you're now leaning hard upon that bosom of God, May they separate themselves from every unbelief, every reason, everything that's contrary to faith. For their faith is now looking to you that they're going to nurse from this day, from this hour, from this minute, from the bosom of Almighty God. And they're going to receive their strength again. Blindness is going to leave and sight's going to be coming back. The cancer, the tumor... The disease is going to depart from the body, and strength and health is going to come back. Grant it, Lord. And if there be those here, Lord, who doesn't know you as their Savior and has never received your Spirit, may they pull right up on the other side and take a hold and say, Lord, you are God, and I'm your child because you're calling me now by your grace. I'm unworthy, I know I am, but something tells me that you're calling me. And I'm coming. Here I am, Lord. I'm just on your hands now. 
I'm coming here weak and wore out and run down. The cares of this life has battled me from place to place. I've been frustrated. I've wondered about the Word and I've wondered whether you really was God, but something has happened to me now. I believe that you are. And I receive you now as my Savior. Let me just lay here, Lord, in your goodness and bathe in your power until my poor, sin-sick soul becomes healed of your power. Grant it, Lord. Bless these dear people. We love May they feed the flock constantly. May every church grow and prosper and great revivals break out through the country. Revival fires be burning on every altar. Grant it, Lord. May there be such a kindling power of this little get-together here that this brotherly uh, come-together will be an example to all churches everywhere. What God will do. May this San Joaquin Valley just be one roaring fire of revival from church to church. Grant it, Lord. For we ask.